to come in. I will welcome you. So, first of all, I'd like to thank the audience to, to come in to the, the second seminar with Professor Tami Vassar. It's a, a, a big pleasure to receive him. And, uh, and thank you for um, uh, bringing to our TC your presence. And I'm sure that it, your talk will be very well received for, for all of us. So I'd like to ask to Bing Sheng. Bing Sheng uh, is a former student pro of Bing Shu, and uh, he will help us today with the introduction of Professor Basar. Okay, thank you, thank you, Tiago. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Tim Basa. He has been with the University of Illinois at Urbana Shenping since 1981, where he currently is Woodland Endowed Chair Emeritus and Center for Advanced Study Professor Eminence of Electrical and Computer Engineering, who is also affiliation with the Coordinated Science Laboratory, Information Trust Institute, and Mechanical Science and Engineering. At Illinois, he has also served as Director of CS, Interim Dean of Engineering and Interim Director of the Batman Institute. He is a member of the US National Academy of Engineering, Fellow of IEEE, IFAC, and SEM, a past president of the IEEE Control Systems Society, the founding president of the International Society of Dynamic Games, and a past president of the American Automatic Control Council. He has received numerous uh, awards and recognition from academic institutions over the years, including the IEEE Control System Award, IEEE Control System Society Board Lecture Prize, and many more. He has around 1,000 publications in systems control, communications, optimization, networks, and dynamic games, including books on non collaborated dynamic games theory, robust control, network security, wireless and communication networks, and stochastic networks. He was editor-in-chief of the IFAC Journal Automatic and is currently editor of several book series. His current research interests include stochastic teams, GANs, and networks, multi-agent system and learning, data-driven distributed optimization, to name just a few. So uh, today, He's going to talk about policy optimization for optimal control with guarantees of robustness. So during the seminar, if you have any questions, you can uh, you are please feel free to type in the chat window, and we will have a Q and A section in the end. Okay, now let's welcome Professor Temabasa. Thank you, thank you for the invitation, and and thanks for the introduction. And uh, and this is uh, uh, your TC is a is a very important and learning and and uh, relevant and current one, and and I see uh, not only in control but uh, in in other uh, fields as well. The learning these days is playing an important role, and and of course, control has a long tradition of uh, uh, dealing with adaptive uh, control, adaptive systems and developing algorithms, uh, which where learning was embedded. And, and this is sort of a revival of uh, that era, which was goes back to 1970s. And, and so there's uh, AI, of course, plays an important role in this uh, recent development. So uh, what I'm going to uh, talk about is uh, some uh, problems uh, that arise in the, uh, within this context, but, uh, but where I will be uh, more focusing on policy optimization, which is an uh, important uh, element or component uh, of learning. And uh, I'll talk about uh, sort of how we can do policy optimization in optimal control and, and also bring in 
uh, robustness guarantees. And that's uh, going back to the uh, connecting with some of the work in the in the 90s, whereas you may know the this community, of course, has contributed to uh, robust control designs in the late 1980s, as well as the 1990s and age infinity control being one of them. So I'm going to uh, really connect connect with those uh, uh, some of those results, but but from a different angle. Now I I'll have to give credit to uh, one of my former students, and he was a student at the time when this work was uh, done. Kai Ching Zhang, who is now at MIT, a postdoc. And uh, and Bin Hu, who is a, a colleague of mine at Illinois. So uh, let me uh, uh, give you uh, share with you uh, an outline uh, of my talk. So I'll be. Of course, you have all heard about reinforcement learning, which is a, a hot current topic. I'll uh, have a brief introduction to that, and and also the policy optimization which arises in this in this context but then I'll uh, move on and and discuss policy optimization for controller design I mean one can use policy optimization for other types of decision making problems uh, as well as policy optimization for games uh, uh, multi-agent games but I'll maybe touch upon that uh, toward the end other than uh, talking about zero sum uh, dynamic games where I'll also uh, discuss policy optimization in that context. And, uh, and then, the, of course, robustness is an important uh, uh, component of controller design. Uh, and, uh, and I'll be talking about different frameworks uh, within which robustness could be considered or formulated. And, uh, and two of these is, are the mixed designs. That is, you want to minimize the H2 norm. And this is for linear uh, quadratic systems, H2 norm subject to some H infinity bound. And, and whether, what are the difficulties in developing policy optimization techniques for, for algorithms for those problems? And then the uh, very closely connected to that in the stochastic domain is the recessive controller design. And then so how can one again uh, develop algorithms uh, using policy optimization where you uh, converge to the to the optimum controller uh, for recessive problems. Now the one of the main challenges in the um, in uh, attacking these problems is that what you are trying to optimize is non-convex. So there is this, this major challenge that arises because of non-convexity and I'll make that clear. And then there is this lack of coercivity, which, which means that the, the essentially, if you just look at the uh, performance index, and uh, you could be violating some of the constraints, but still the performance index does not give you any message uh, related to that. It doesn't, it doesn't give you any indication that you are violating that. So that's whereas in the linear quadratic uh, regulator problem, for example, with uh, under some structural assumptions, uh, you do have, and if, if stability is, is concerned, then definitely if you reach closer to the, to the boundary of the stability region, or if you violate it, then, then this immediately shows up in the, uh, in the cost function. And uh, so, so this uh, brings us a challenge and, and we have introduced what we call implicit regularization into the algorithms. And, and particularly I'll be talking about two, two different algorithms. And, and which have uh, sub and super linear rates. And then make connections as time allows to robust adversarial reinforcement learning, which is an important current topic in uh, AI and machine learning these days. And, uh, and, and this is uh, for linear systems, I'm going to discuss this. And then I'll have extensions and conclusions.
So, so reinforcement learning is uh, essentially, is, I mean, uh, definitely has achieved tremendous success in sequential decision making, not only in control, but 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 also in general decision making problems. And uh, and such as game of Go and video games and robotics. So these are the the important applications where uh, the success of RL uh, has been established. And and most of these essentially uh, built on policy optimization. So you have a function that you want to optimize, and then you do. A, a function approximation. You approximate this in terms and then bring it uh, to essentially a parameter optimization problem and, uh, and then develop an algorithm for obtaining these, uh, the optimum values of these parameters. So these are uh, fairly easy to implement and, and they are scalable to high dimensional control systems when we apply these to control systems. And, and they also enable, if you have, uh, if you don't know the model of the system, then, then, then you have to do model uh, free designs. And, and these algorithms also open the door for data-driven or sample-based uh, searches. And some prominent examples in this uh, context are the reinforced actor critical algorithm, natural policy gradient, and I'll be talking about this in particular and deterministic policy gradient and the trust region and proximal uh, policy optimization. So now uh, let me just talk about the basics uh, uh, of optimal control. You want to minimize a certain function over an infinite horizon. Let's assume that this is, you have the right condition so that this is bounded. And, uh, and you have a state equation. And, uh, and here I have a discrete time state equation. You can have it in continuous time as well. And, uh, and then you have a, a certain control constraint set. So, so you want to minimize this. And, and so we know the, the theory, optimal control theory that can be used, maximum principle or dynamic programming, uh, which can be used to obtain the, uh, the solution. But this generally leads to uh, highly complicated equations that one has one has to solve. So, so what is the policy optimization approach? You parameterize the control policy. So, so I'm I'm dealing with uh, feedback controls in this case, and there are extensions to if you have partial observation, which I'm not going to touch on. That's still a current research uh, topic. But let's assume that we have. Uh, uh, state information available to the controller without delay at this point. And, uh, and so, so you, you have the control, uh, all uh, maybe uh, functions, Boyle measurable functions of X, XT. And uh, now you parameterize it in terms of uh, a parameter vector theta. And so I write this ut as uh, mu theta xt. And, and you, you uh, therefore, if you substitute this into your cost function and using the state dynamics, then you would essentially be, and, and note that since this is an infinite horizon problem, I'm assuming here that there is a, a, a stationary uh, policy uh, that is optimal. For this, for this problem. And conditions for that, of course, can, can, can be established. The, uh, so you substitute this, and so what you obtain is a, uh, a function uh, of theta, and theta is a finite dimensional parameter, and then you do optimization with respect to theta using your uh, uh, favorite algorithm. Now, for the linear quadratic regulator, the, of course, we know this is the bread and butter of uh, control theorists. Uh, you have the F is linear and C is quadratic, and there is no constraint on you. It's, it's an M-dimensional Euclidean space. Now, in that case, the parametrization is a very natural one. Now, normally for nonlinear control problems, when you do parametrization, even if you obtain the optimum values for theta, you are losing something, of course, because it may not be in that parametric form, the optimal solution. 
But in the linear quadratic regulator problem, we know that the solution is linear. There exists under controllability and observable assumptions. Uh, there is a unique controller, feedback controller. And, uh, and, and so the, this matrix K is what your theta is in that case. So you are not losing anything as far as the approximation goes. The only thing you might be losing is when you develop an algorithm uh, if that algorithm, if you stop it before it converges, then of course you won't be obtaining the optimal solution. Now, this is all fine. Uh, and, and there are recent results on, on how to uh, develop algorithms so, so that you can have a fast convergence in the, in the theta uh, space. And uh, of course, the downside, and this is going, this is well known to uh, to this community, is that LQR is not robust. Uh, it's not robust to noise. It's not robust to disturbances, and and not robust to modeling imprecision. So that has motivated the community uh, to introduce some additional uh, constraints on the problem. And, and this has led to robust optimal control problems so that you have minimum sensitivity in a sense to unmodeled dynamics. You have minimum sensitivity to any disturbance which is not modeled or any noise that may come into the... Into the... So, uh, so what you have is now you're uh, optimizing, uh, again, a certain objective function, but with some guarantee of robustness. And, and there are different ways of uh, capturing robustness or, or mathematically formulating robustness. Uh, and one of them is the risk sensitive control that brings in, and I'll discuss this uh, uh, a bit later. Uh, the other one is the H infinity norm, uh, which means that uh, you uh, want you uh, have a bound on the uh, uh, mapping from the the disturbance to the to the output, and then uh, some norm bound, and that's the H infinity norm bound, and uh, and you want to design a controller which which satisfies that bound. So you have this provides some guarantee, and then there is also the worst case disturbance that is the unmodeled part of the system. Uh, you model uh, as an additional input into the state and, uh, and which is controlled by an adversary under some uh, effort constraints. And this leads to a, a game, a zero sum game where the controller is the minimizer and the, uh, the adversary uh, or the disturbance is the maximizer. Uh, so that's the worst case uh, approach. And, uh, and those three ways, actually, all these three with sensitive control, H infinity, uh, uh, norm constraint based uh, control, is, and the zero sum game approach, they can all be unified through this H to H infinity mixed design. So, so I'm going to discuss the H to H infinity mixed design in this talk from the optimal uh, uh, control and policy optimization point of view. And, uh, and, then, and then show the, the, the links to risk sensitive control as well as to, to zero sum games. So, so, so what, as I indicated at the beginning, what this entails is that you are minimizing an H2 norm subject to an H infinity norm constraint. Now, the, the challenge in this is that it is a constrained non-convex optimization problem. Yeah. Both the, so when you parameterize your controller, the, uh, this is in the, in the linear quadratic setting, uh, you lose the convex there uh, when you do the parameterization. It's no longer convex in terms of the, that parameter. And the uh, constraint region uh, is also not convex. So you are dealing with an unconvex optimization problem. So, so many uh, reinforcement learning and many uh, optimal control problems uh, can be formulated in this way. This, of course, applies to nonlinear systems as well. So what we are minimizing is uh, a function of k. I use k, but this does not necessarily have to be a linear 
system, view K as, as the theta I had introduced earlier, where K belongs to some constraints, okay? And so you want to minimize J and, uh, and this is a parameterization of the policy or the controller. The constraint set is, is, is very important, is an essential component of this optimization problem. And, but sometimes it enters quite implicitly. For example, in the linear quadratic regulator problem, the constraint, I mean, this is all well known, what we are looking for is, uh, is a stabilizing K, definitely. Uh, so you restrict yourself. We know that the optimum under controllability and observability uh, conditions, there exists an optimum stabilizing controller. And, and so therefore you can restrict yourself to uh, the set where the spectral radius of A minus B, K is less than one. And so in this case, K is an unconvex constraint. Set. So, so you, you substitute this UT into here, you obtain a, actually what you obtain again, the J of K is an unconvex function in that case. But then it has some very nice properties and which enables one to uh, obtain policy optimization uh, for this uh, 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 algorithms uh, for this problem. And uh, uh, the uh, one nice thing is that it's coercive. In other words, if you reach to the boundary of the constraint set, then the, the J becomes unbounded, becomes, uh, so, so that's, and I mentioned this at the beginning, this is uh, an indicator, a signaling that, that uh, uh, you are reaching into a dangerous zone and that algorithm takes care of that because, because the gradient does not go in that direction. And uh, so other examples of K, that's the constraint set would be boundedness, of case norm, you put some, some uh, natural, this is in industrial applications, this definitely arises. And, and you may also have some safety constraints on the states that you want, you don't want X to, uh, to go outside the state to go outside a certain tube. So, uh, the, uh, I'm interested here in uh, additional constraints on K, which are related to, to robustness. And, uh, and, and one thing, and this is, of course, the, uh, you all are very well versed with this uh, diagram. Uh, you have uh, a plan that you want to control. Uh, in this case, the output of the plan feeds into uh, um, K, uh, a controller, linear controller, but then you, you have some uncertainty. The, the plant, there is some uncertainty around the plant. And this is the so-called the delta. You wrap a delta around it. And uh, so this is your actual system G and this is the, the imprecision uh, around the plant. So uh, if you look at the close of transfer function from W to the uh, input to the, to the output, let's call it by TK. Uh, then, the, then we would be interested in, in sort of placing a bound on the H infinity norm of TK. Now this G delta model covers many robustness considerations in control. For example, you could have in the, in the linear uh, system, the, there could be perturbations around the A and B matrices, delta A, delta B, that can definitely be absorbed uh, into delta. And uh, there could be time varying parameters, there could be time varying delays, or even dynamical uncertainty, such as unknown model order. So that this can all be uh, uh, captured by this uh, perturbation delta. And the, the one important uh, uh, notion here is, the, uh, is, as I said, the H infinity norm, which is placed as a, as a, as a constraint on the controller, on the system itself. And, uh, and the small gain theorem, uh, going back to Zames uh, in 1966, tells us that the, if the H infinity norm of T is less than gamma and, and this uh, uncertainty that you wrap around the system uh, is in norm from L2 to L2 is less than one over gamma, that is the product is less than one, 
then G delta is input output stable. So therefore you pick a, a delta and a specific delta and this allows some perturbation around the, the plan. Depending on what you think that perturbation is going to be, we'll, we'll determine the delta and then, and then you do a design based on that value of delta. And note that the, if, the, the, if this bound uh, increases, then, then this one has to decrease. So you have a, you have a more uh, constrained problem. So therefore, the, uh, going from LQR to this problem, so what we do is, is you uh, uh, add this additional constraint. That is the H infinity norm of, uh, of uh, TK has to be less than gamma, in addition to stability. A minus, the spectral radius of A minus TK is less than one. And, and so this uh, brings in a certain level of strong robust stability. And, and clearly, as if, if gamma is very, uh, goes to infinity, it becomes very large, then this is a very loose constraint, then you essentially end up with the stability region of LQR. So depending on the choice of gamma, you can uh, capture the uh, results on LQR. So now the important thing here, the open uh, question is if you are learning when you do this uh, optimization with respect to K, a policy optimization, you start with an initial sort of K value for K and then you update and, and you want to make sure that during that updating process, which I call the learning process, uh, all the, the constraints are met. So you don't go outside the constraint region. Now, as I indicated with the LQR, uh, pure LQR, that is if you are going along the direction of the gradient, uh, then, then that takes care of it. But, but in, in other types of problems, particularly in this robust control problem, uh, this is not the case. So you could easily violate this H infinity constraint while doing the learning. So we want to avoid that. And the question is whether you can develop algorithms which, has, which have that additional feature, which is very important because you don't want to wait until the, the, the end uh, of convergence, uh, you would be using your your gain uh, to the throughout the learning process, and and the and the plant would be uh, would be uh, operating during that time. And and so the the uh, the first open question, therefore, is how can we enforce or maintain robust stability and uh, during the learning process. And the second is uh, what are the global convergence guarantees and the rates of convergence of policy optimization for problems of this type, okay, for robust control. So, so we, can, we have developed uh, a, a comprehensive theory over the last two or three years, uh, which addresses this uh, problem. And, and uh, it's both in continuous time and discrete time. And, but I'm going to uh, uh, stay with the discrete time problem. And, and we have uh, various uh, sort of uh, publications, some archive publications and, and uh, uh, a paper which uh, is shorter than the archive publication, but, but it has essentially all the results. Uh, will appear in the Science Journal on Control and Optimization uh, this year, uh, in the, within the next couple of months. And then we have a shorter version in the, in the uh, proceedings of the machine learning research going back to 2020. Okay, so, so this is all familiar uh, to you, this, this system. And, and normally it's, it's a, 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 an assumption that is made that uh, the here in the output, U uh, of course is the control, X is the state, the C is orthogonal to E, or E is orthogonal to C. So therefore E transpose C, E is zero times R. And this is your uh, uh, representation of the, uh, of the transfer function, which in precise terms uh, for the discrete time, it has this form, for the continuous time, it has this form. And we're looking for the, 
H infinity norm. And for continuous time, of course, from L2 to L2, uh, capital and, and discrete time, lowercase L2 to L2 uh, is the operator norm from W to, to Z. And in the continuous time, it's the maximum singular value of HK. Uh, and uh, in the other, uh, in the discrete time, it is the maximum eigenvalue uh, square root of that, uh, of the HK transpose HK. Okay, so I'm going to focus on discrete time problem as I indicated, and these papers have the continuous time versions as well in their, in their appendices. Okay, so, the, so this is the problem that we are interested in. And we want to minimize some JK side versus constraint. And, uh, and normally, the, uh, I mean, you, you can have a, an, a very a sort of useful upper bound on JK, which also relates to, to with sensitive control where, when it's exact. And this was obtained by Bernstein and Haddad in 89. And uh, so JK, uh, an upper bound, on JK, it can be written in this form or in this form where P solves a Riccati equation. So this is a given K. Again, the, we have the parametrization, but exact parametrization, because we know, we also know that in this in this problem, the the uh, and in other related problems like with sensitivity control and the, also the zero sum games, the linear controller is the is the best controller that you can have. So we're not losing anything uh, through that linear parametrization. And uh, so so you you let u equal to k, and then uh, uh, you write down the uh, the function uh, j k, which is written either in this form or in this form, and then p uh, in this case solves a Riccati equation given k. Okay. And A is the feedback matrix. A K tilde is the feedback matrix. A minus B K. So, so this is the classical formulation of optimal control with robustness. Now, the uh, there is a uh, going back to 1973. Jacobson introduced uh, the sense. This sense of control was introduced earlier in the economics literature, and uh, but but this was the first time a linear exponential quadratic Gaussian problem was, was addressed, and which is essential the following. And, and the reason why I'm introducing this is, is because it provides a motivation for the also for the algorithms that we are, we are developing. And, and it provides a much more exact expression for the control, uh, for the objective function to be optimized, parameterized one, uh, than the H2H infinity one. So, so you have a discrete time, there is a continuous time version of this as well. Uh, so you have a stochastic system now where W is, a, is, is noise, uh, it's Gaussian noise with covariant okay. W. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and, and then you have the initial, initial state, which is again Gaussian with zero mean and covariance six zero. Now, instead of, instead of uh, using the uh, minimization, minimizing the expected value uh, of this quantity, which would be the normal uh, sort of linear quadratic regulator for stochastic systems, uh, you essentially scale it up by a, a parameter, which is called with sensitivity parameter, and, uh, and then take exponentiator, you exponentiate it, and then take the expected value, and then take the logarithm. And, uh, and then you bring it so that you can, you normalize it in a sense, uh, uh, multiply it by two over beta, and then the, uh, take the average, uh, time average of this and look at the limb soup. So, so this is the one. So, so one can actually show that there exists a, a threshold value for beta star, so that if uh, beta is less than beta star, the minimum of this, this is a well-defined problem. Its minimum exists and there exists and the problem admits a unique optimal control, which is linear in the state. And, and, and this uh, beta star parameter is, beta star value is important that corresponds to the disturbance attenuation 
uh, uh, threshold gamma star in terms of the one over gamma star is, is, is beta. So, so essentially, uh, what this uh, risk sensitivity uh, does, uh, it, it puts by exponentiating, uh, you are placing, so you may say, where is robustness in this case? By exponentiating, you place more weight to unfavorable sample paths of the, of the system. And, uh, and uh, so, so it's, a, it's sort of a pessimistic approach, but this is in line with the robustness considerations that we bring into control. And, uh, and, and the reason why you have this is because beyond the point, so this is a degree of data, is a degree of pessimism, and you cannot be overly pessimist. If you are too pessimist, then, then the, uh, the value would be infinite. Okay, so if you put almost infinite weight on the, on the unfavorable paths, then there isn't much you can do. So there's a limit to, for the problem to be well-defined, there's a limit to the degree of pessimism that an individual would have or that a control designer would have. Okay, so, so uh, if I choose Q to be equal to C transpose C in the, in the original formulation and W to be D, D transpose, then uh, and pick u to be k times minus k times x sub t. The feasible set that is the feasible set here. You need stability, and uh, and and you need uh, uh, this condition. But this is the same as as the h infinity norm of t k being less than one over square root of uh, beta. So there is a direct correspondence between. Uh, uh, between this risk sensitive control problem and the uh, and the uh, H2H infinity mix design. But in one case, the, the, the what we are minimizing is a, it's an upper bound on the cost. In this case, it's exact as the next slide is going to, to show. And uh, so so therefore, again, in the Swiss sensitive control problem, there is no Parametrization, linear parametrization does not lead to any uh, approximation. The only approximation is how well you can do this parameter, uh, parametric optimization. And uh, so you again have the, uh, an expression for the, so let me just uh, state this lemma. This is an expression that we had seen earlier in the case of mix H2 is an upper bound. In this case, it's an exact bound. So, so if I, if I develop, uh, so therefore this connects the two problems. Essentially the policy optimization boils down to minimizing this function uh, with respect to uh, the parameter K where you have uh, uh, two conditions. So the, so the condition on beta uh, can be expressed in terms of these two. This combines the stability together with the, the uh, growth, a growth condition. And then we have another one, which is existence of a solution to the generalized algebraic Riccati equation so that we have a non-negative definite solution. Okay. So, so, so the, uh, this uh, uh, also covers this formulation maximum entropy H infinity control, which was introduced by Glover and Doyle, and uh, and as well as linear quadratic zero sum dynamic games. Now, let me talk a little bit about the uh, this uh, uh, the zero sum equivalence to this. So now the for the system. So we are now again back in the deterministic domain, and uh, uh, but instead of just an uh, a system driven by, by you, by the controller, I have the system also driven by uh, a, a disturbance, which is unknown. So D times VT. So this is the disturbance. And now the objective, of course, if you don't place any restriction on, on VT, then the disturbance could drive you to infinity. So that's not a reasonable problem. So you have to place some constraint on the effort level of the disturbance or the adversary. And, and the natural one seems to be uh, adding to this cost uh, a, a negative term minus gamma squared 
times Vt transpose Vt. So this is a cost on the effort level. And gamma is the, is the sort of the, the uh, penalty, if you like, of, for excessive amounts of V. And there is a strong connection between this zero sum game and the risk sensitive control problem, which is that the beta there is one over gamma squared here. And the policies are identical. And, uh, uh, but the only difference, and this makes a difference in policy optimization, in the risk sensitive control problem, there is a single controller that, and the parameterization of that controller that we are optimizing. But in the, in the zero sum game, you have two players. You have the controllers, so you have this ut equals to minus uh, k times xt, but you also have an adversary, uh, which is minus l times xt, which we know that this is the optimum action by the adversary itself, the optimal policy. So therefore you have two parameters in this case to worry about even though the two problems are equivalent uh, as far as the, their optimum values goes and as far as the optimal controller goes, here you have to have, there is the, if, if you attack it as a zero sum game, you have this additional sort of uh, uh, thing uh, to worry about. The, the uh, policy optimization with respect to K and also policy optimization with respect to L. And in what order do you do this if you develop an algorithm? So, so that's, that's the, the sort of the, uh, the challenge when you approach it through a zero sum game, but, the, but that, can be, that can be handled. And it has been in some of our recent work. And as gamma goes to infinity, uh, again, you have the, the, there is no disturbance because the disturbance is uh, essentially would be zero there because any effort would be very costly. And, uh, and so you essentially end up with minimizing this, which is, which is the JK subject to uh, the stability constraint, which is the, the natural thing, uh, LQR problem, okay? So, so now I'll be talking about the algorithm. So, so therefore what I have, justified is that a problem of interest which covers a broad domain and a broad framework is minimizing this function uh, in terms of the parameter k and uh, subject to two constraints okay and the, and the way the k enters into this into this cost function is through this uh, Riccati equation or generalized Riccati equation. Okay, so now this is something I alluded to earlier. The, uh, this is coercivity versus non-coercivity. Uh, in LQR, uh, our only constraint is stability. And, uh, and, and the, and but but what you are doing, you are interacting with the system, and you are observing. Or if you are using a gradient-based approach, then then you are uh, taking the next iteration in the direction, at least locally, uh, where the j decreases. And uh, so what one can show is that so so these are the equal cost. Uh, uh, Lines so, uh, and and this what you have as the uh, for k, uh, then you you do uh, in, you have instability. Okay, so so in the LQR problem, as you go uh, from k, you start with a k in that region, and you uh, iterate along the gradient. Let's say. And, uh, and then you still, uh, you go to a lower value for J and you still remain in, the, in the, uh, this set. Note that it's, it's not convex. Whereas in the case of H2H infinity control, if you start with a K, which is, uh, satisfies both bounds, then you may end up, even though you are minimizing the cost 
you will end up, you may, and uh, so through simulations we can show that, you can end up with uh, at the next uh, point of the iteration with a K prime, which is on the boundary of the constraint set. Okay, so, so this is non coercivity. And uh, uh, so the H2, H infinity mixed design problem over K is non convex and non coercive. And as K reaches the boundary of K, the boundary of the constraints at K, J does not necessarily approach to infinity. So that's a, that's a big challenge. So can you come up with an algorithm which does not necessarily use this information on J, but, but still uh, uh, remains uh, at every step of the iteration remains, uh, leads to a K which is within the constraint set. So in contrast, the LQR, as I said, JK descent cannot ensure feasibility, okay? So how can we then enforce uh, K during learning? So, so we have looked at uh, uh, three algorithms and with some rigor behind them. Uh, one is policy gradient. So this is a natural, so you take the gradient of J and note that the J is differentiable with respect to K. So we don't have to, We'll talk about uh, um, uh, subgradients or or anything that's that's more sophisticated. So so this is the uh, eta is the step size, and uh, so this is known as the policy gradient. You pick the step size appropriately. The next one is natural policy gradient, where you post multiply the gradient by the inverse of a lambda which is the solution to this Lyapunov equation. And then there's the Gauss-Newton one where, where you, in addition to post-multiplying, you also pre-multiply the gradient by this value. So, and uh, so the, this natural uh, policy gradient is policy gradient of a Riemannian manifold. And uh, Gauss-Newton, uh, with eta equals to one half reduces to policy iteration for LQ games. But that's uh, maybe if I have time, I'll address this. So regularization, what's regularization or implicit regularization? As I said, is the, when you iterate on K, are you, do you stay in, in script K in the constraint region? Now, one way, of, one way of making sure that when you do the iteration, you are in the stable region or you are in the constraint region is to do projection. But in this case, this is not a viable approach because K is not convex, okay? And what we have been able to show is that the two of these algorithms, not the gradient based, and the reason for why the gradient uh, uh, does not do it because you have the direction in which J uh, decreases does not give you any indication as to whether you are staying within the constraint set or not. But uh, it turns out that the natural policy gradient with some choice of the step size and the Gauss-Newton, Gauss they implicitly regularize the iterates and they preserve robust stability. So, so here is the, uh, is, the, is the main theorem. Uh, for the Gauss-Newton, you have to choose the uh, step size to be less than or equal to one half. And for the natural policy gradient, you choose it to be less than or equal to this. And this is uh, P tilde. So K zero is, uh, is, is some initial choice for K. So the initial choice is important you know, of the iteration. So if, if you use either of these two algorithms with these step size choices, then if you are uh, in K at any point of the iteration, if you are in that constraint set, then you remain in that constraint set. So the, so the general, so what is the message here? The message is that, the, and we have many examples, simulation example, which show that policy gradient regardless of what you take, the step size does not work. So, so the descent directions of JK do not work, but certain directions, if you modify the, the, 
design directions by either post or pre-multiplying with appropriate step sizes, then, then it works. And the proof, I, I don't think I have time to go into the proof, but, but we use bounded wheel lemma to, uh, uh, for the proof. So I'm going very fast. And then it's, a, it's an LMI based proof technique. Uh, with the bounded wheel lemma, uh, we can uh, relate to picking a K in the constraint set to a Riccati equation as a solution, if and only if. And then that leads to a strict Riccati inequality. And then we construct a solution to a non-strict Riccati inequality and do some perturbation around it and then uh, end up with a strict Riccati inequality and so on. So the next, so I had two questions. One uh, was whether we can uh, stay in the constraint set, we can develop an algorithm, even though the constraint set is not convex, uh, whether we stay in the cons uh, there in the iterations. And the second one was the way of convergence, global convergence, regardless of where you start and, and what is the rate of convergence. And uh, suppose that uh, you start with, of course, you have to start with uh, an initial uh, point k zero in the script k, which is norm bounded, and and assume that we have uh, controllability of this pair, uh, this and d uh, at the stationary point of k then under the step size choices that i had previously for the two algorithms uh, they both converge to the global optimum uh, with uh, one over n rate and uh, uh, now the, this controllability assumption this is for the h2 h infinity problem and it's automatically satisfied for the leqg uh, because the, the noise covariance. So this is because you are essentially uh, perturbing the system. You have a noise there, which is uh, white noise, which is perturbing the system. So you have excitation and, and that's related to excitation in some sense. So for LEQG, you do not need this condition at all. So, so both of these algorithms converge. And uh, now in the LQR, which was actually uh, uh, initiated the re research on this the algorithm development by uh, a group from the University of Washington and uh, which appeared in, the, in ICML in uh, 2018, uh, there is global gradient domination. As I indicated, the, the uh, uh, LQR is coercive and uh, but it's non-convex but but it's uh, the cost function is not convex but in spite of that there is a nice property which is global gradient domination which is not uh, does not uh, is not featured in this robust control problem and uh, uh, so that's the reason why we have one over and great global now the uh, Local rates, if you start closer to the solution, then you have faster convergence, which, which would be super linear rates around the current. I'm running out of time. So I'm going, uh, I mean, the simulations really, they tell you the story that, that what happens when you start away from the boundary initialization and the performance of the system, this all shows convergence. And then what happens if you are closer to the boundary and note that in one case, the, the gradient, this is the red one, the gradient, it violates the H infinity constraint. So this is the constraint that we want to be satisfied. It violates initially and then, and then it uh, converges, okay. So uh, now the, for zero sum games, let me just very quickly, uh, I indicated that there is a connection. Uh, in fact, they are equivalent between risk sensitive control, uh, LEQG, and zero sum games. 
as far as the, the controller goes. So in other words, if you, if you minimize the risk sensitive uh, objective and obtain the controller, that is also a safe control for the uh, minimizer in the zero sum game. But there is another element here, L, and uh, there is another parameter, L. So, so you want to solve the min max. So you have the uh, uh, minimize this with respect to K and maximize with respect to L. And, uh, and this is of interest in, in the multi-agent reinforcement learning uh, community recently. And uh, because uh, this leads to robust adversarial RL, you want to robustify the reinforcement learning. And there is a, it was observed that there is a simulation to real gap in reinforcement learning. And, and for that reason, an adversary was introduced into MDP formulation. So, so this is a very relevant uh, problem uh, to that community as well, but, but we are approaching it because of the equivalence between the resensitive control and the, and the, and the zero sum games. So, so the, the main problem, and I don't have time to really uh, go into this is, uh, how do you iterate? Do you, do you iterate simultaneously on K and L? Can you develop an algorithm? Or do you uh, uh, pick a K and iterate on L until you have a good convergence, uh, maybe an approximate one, uh, which we call inner loop, and, and then come back and update on K. Now, there's enough evidence that if you iterate, take turns in K and L, that doesn't converge. I mean, it could converge in some cases, but, but there is no guarantee of convergence. So, so one way of doing it is, is, is to uh, introduce an outer loop and an inner loop, and uh, for fix K, maximize over L. Uh, if you cannot maximize exactly, then, then you do some approximation. And the question is, how does the, that approximation propagate over the uh, steps of the iteration? So that's what we have studied in this, in this context. I don't have time to go uh, into it. Uh, and, and it's still, the, the challenge here is that it's still a non-convex, non-concave problem. In other words, the, the, now we, when I talked about the resensitive control or H to H infinity, we just talked about non-convexity because there was only one parameter. Now here you need concavity with respect to L and convexity with respect to K in order to be applied, to be able to apply the, uh, the standard min-max theorem. But, but that's not the case here. You have, in terms of these parameters, you have non, it's non-convex with respect to K and non-concave with respect to L, which, which brings in uh, constraints. So, so this is uh, alternating gradient or gradient descent. I mean, uh, this shows you that when you do iterations and these are not sort of carefully chosen iterations, you pick anything at random and then you would end up with the same. This is the stability region. Uh, you don't want to reach one. And, and here you can see that you reach. Here it looks like it is stable, and, uh, but all of a sudden it just blows up. So, so there's all this difficulty in uh, assuring that, that with random initialization, and uh, and with alternating gradient or gradient descent ascent, uh, uh, you you do not have convergence. So so the question is, what's a good combination of initialization and update? And then we have a, a sort of a paper in in Neurips in in 2020, uh, which discusses this. But we have uh, uh, let me see. We. So we, uh, the best way to approach this is this double loop problem, inner loop, outer loop. And then you, you start with a K zero and then with an L zero. And then, and then you do an enough sort of an, obtain a reliably approximate solution for L in response to K. And then you update K. 
in a particular way. Okay, so I'm I'm uh, uh, I think I'm running out of time. Then we have uh, our paper. We have a, another one with uh, another student uh, join, uh, which talks about the derivative free policy optimization for both resensitive and robust control design. This was uh, this is on the archives. And, uh, and, and this is the case when you mark for the model free uh, uh, design. If you just are sampling trajectories, can you still achieve these grades? And we show that yes, you can, provided that you can sample them, them properly. Okay, so, and then uh, how to do it in the case of uh, uh, zero sum games, you, you, you have to have a virtual adversary who's optimizing against the controller. So there is an interaction with an adversary in that case. It's, it's again a double loop uh, optimization problem. Okay, so let me uh, conclude. Uh, so what I have tried to do is, is uh, uh, to give you uh, some overview of some of the issues that arise when we bring in robustness is an additional uh, uh, requirement in controller design and how to do policy-based optimization, which is naturally uh, uh, something that will be needed if you do policy uh, model-free uh, design, control design, interacting with the system only and, and, and uh, driving it with, with data. And the uh, H-infinity norm constraints I talked about, I, I uh, discussed global convergence and then the implicit regulation and, uh, and, and convergence guarantees and connections to linear quadratic zero-sum uh, dynamic games. Now, the sample complexity is an issue with, and, uh, and we have recent results on this. Uh, the zeroth order methods fail in this case. We have to go higher order methods. And the mixed design for other types of dynamical systems, nonlinear systems, for example, is, is an important. I don't think that has been uh, looked at. And uh, uh, if we turn the problem around, and if you say, I want to design a policy optimization uh, algorithm to minimize the H infinity norm itself. Note that what we, what we had here was you have a bound on the H infinity norm and, uh, and you want to design a controller based on that bound. What if I want to find a controller which will minimize the H infinity norm? That's a non-smooth problem. And uh, it may be of interest to some communities. And uh, at the high level, it's how can we enforce safety, robustness constraints on the fly? So that's important. The, uh, while you are learning, you want to make sure that all the safety constraints are satisfied. And that's, that's the reason why these problems are challenging because, because you, you cannot afford in, in many safety critical applications uh, deviating from the constraint region or violating the constraints because that could lead to devastating effects and particularly important in model free environments. Okay, so I'll stop here. I'm sorry. I think I took uh, exactly an hour after the introduction, but sorry for going over a bit. Thank you, Professor Bassa, for the presentation. It was really good. Thank you for sharing this content. Uh, I think people uh, enjoyed the presentation. So uh, 